I'm delighted to be back at Walk. <laughs> Thank you um, for the invitation. And let me ask you, um, if you will, to uh, turn to a person who is sitting next to you. And I'd like you uh, to discuss just for a moment what these two uh, pictures have in common. What are some of the things that these pictures have in common? So take, take a moment. Really, I'm going to wait. I want you to talk. <laughs> Format, yeah. Hmm? Okay. Okay, so I hear some people saying that the colors in common, there's a big blue, or maybe the letters at the bottom. Uh, how about some other, any other ideas? Some mystery. Okay. Any other thoughts? Round shapes. Good. Anybody else? Big eyes. Big eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you say so. Uh, the thing I was thinking about is that both of these pictures uh, enjoy equal copyright protection under the law. It's a very important point. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about copyright. So w when we talk about openness in education, first thing I think we have to do is define some terms. What does open mean and what does education mean? So for, um, for several years now, maybe a decade, when we've said open, we use open as an adjective to describe uh, a variety of other resources like open textbooks, uh, open educational resources, open courseware, even open source software. So open is a word that describes some kinds of educational materials. Um, and generally, these educational materials that are open, what that means is that they are shared with us uh, in a way that doesn't cost us any money. And it gives us permission to engage in four kinds of activities. I call them the four R's. So we can reuse these materials without any cost. We can redistribute them. We can share them and give them away. Uh, to others at no cost. We can revise them or make changes or improvements or adaptations to them. And we can also remix them. We can take this one and another one and combine them into something new. And we can engage in all these activities without having to pay any money. That's what an open license gives us. Now, these four R's, the permission to engage in these four R's, that's something different from what you get in traditional copyright. So in order to communicate to someone that they have these extra permissions, we have to use some kind of license. Um, I guess most everyone here at the walk knows about the Creative Commons licenses. These are the most popular ones. And these licenses all communicate to people that they have permission to engage in these 4R activities. I guess you've seen these little buttons uh, at the bottom of web pages and things. Um, this is some of the most recent data about uh, Creative Commons uh, adoption around the world. So you can see that in, uh, this is from the middle of 2009, you can see that in mid-2009 there were 250 million uh, pictures and uh, sound recordings and texts and things like this that used a Creative Commons license. So the nouns that the word open modifies, things like open content or open educational resources or open courseware. The words at the end are very different, uh, but this word open is the same. And the kinds of activities that operationalize this idea of openness are the same. Basically, when we're talking about being open, we're talking about being generous, we're talking about sharing, we're talking about giving, uh, and these kinds of ideas. In other words, we're, we're not talking about the response that a little child has when she pounds on the floor and says, that's mine. What, how do you say mine in common? Mill. No. And do little kids shout this very loudly and they <laughs> get into fights? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So being open is the opposite 
of this kind of feeling, of saying mine, 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 and pounding on the table. Unfortunately, um, law and policy both make it very easy for us to be selfish. Um, they let us shout mine louder and give us big toys to hit each other over the head with. And because law and policy make it easy for us to do this, it's, uh, it's become kind of standard to think that this is okay. It's okay to be selfish because the law says I can. It's okay to sue you if you download my paper because the law says I can. And if the law says I can, then it must be okay. So being selfish is fine. And unfortunately, you know, in our institutions of education, um, this kind of thinking is accepted much more often than it ought to be. So I've been asked many times, what is the role, what's the right role for this idea of being open in education? And I think this is a horrible, awful question. Because if I say to you, what's the role for something, you, you might say, well, there's a big role or a small role or a very important role or a critical, you might talk about it in different ways, but there's not a role for openness in education. Openness is the only way of doing education. There's not another way to do it. If you're not sharing what you know with someone else and you're not sharing feedback with them about their assignments and you're not, if there's no sharing going on, there is no education happening. Now we might share a lot or share a little. We might only share with those people who pay. Uh, but if you don't share, there's no teaching and learning going on. And I hope to convince you of that point uh, over the course of the presentation here. If there's no sharing, there's no education. So coming back around to education then, just to give a quick definition, I would say that education is the relationship that two people enter into when they share with each other. Right? So if there's something that you know, and I don't know it, but I'd like to know it, and I'd like you to share it with me, now we're in an education that now we're in a relationship where you're going to share, then I'm going to share with you what I think I understood that you said. You're going to share with me, no, you got it a little bit wrong. And we're going to share with each other, and we're going to continue sharing until we're both kind of happy with how it's ended up. Mm -hmm. and that's what education is. It's that relationship where you share with each other. In fact, we say the very most successful educators are the educators who do the best job of sharing. The, if I have students in a classroom and I'm able to successfully share with them all the things that I want them to learn, every student gets a hold of every idea, then I'm a successful educator because I'm a successful sharer. If I share those ideas with you in a, or those skills with you in a way that you're able to get a hold of them and hold on to them, then I've shared successfully, which means I'm a successful teacher. Now the things that we share, these ideas or skills, um, I'll, I'll say expertise. Um, expertise is non-rivalrous and by that I mean we don't have to have some kind of contest to see who gets it. Um, like this water bottle, you know, if you have it then I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I fight you for it, you know, to take it away from you. But expertise and information and ideas aren't like that. I can, they can be given without being given away. Um, you, there's a famous quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, that says, he who receives ideas from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine. You know, if I give you, if I tell you my idea, I don't have to forget it in order to tell it to you. I can tell you and we can both remember. He says, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. If you have a candle and I have a candle and mine's lit, I can light your candle without mine going out, right? And ideas are the same have the same kind of quality. Um, and it's a very good thing that ideas have this kind of quality. You, you may know that some honeybees, when they sting you, if they sting you one time, then they die and, and they're done. And imagine if expertise and ideas and information were not non-rivalrous. Then for me to teach you ideas, I would have to forget them. I'd be like this honeybee. I could teach one time. And then I'd be done because I'd have to forget everything I knew when I taught it to you. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine a world in which ideas work that way.
progress would certainly be very slow. Now, expressions of our expertise, when I take that expertise outside of me and I write it on some paper and I express that outside of myself, those are the kinds of things that can be copyrighted. And they're also the kinds of things that don't have this same magic kind of quality, right? If I give you a book, I have to give it away for you to have it. You know, so if I'm looking at these books here and book number five is missing uh, because Julia has it checked out, then I have to wait for him to bring it back before I can use it. In other words, the expressions of our expertise are things that we have to fight over or compete for. Um, at least they used to be. Now, when we can express ideas and information digitally, uh, we find ourselves in a situation where ideas and their expressions are both non-rivalrous, and we don't have to compete for them. So if you go onto the web to read the news, um, 100,000 people can all be reading this website at the same time. It's not like the newspaper. If I'm reading it, then you have to wait for me to finish before I can give one to you. Hundreds of thousands of people can all use this site simultaneously. So it's a very, very important uh, change. It's something I think we take for granted. We don't think about it very often. But this idea that now, after thousands of years of writing and of different kinds of ways of capturing information outside of ourselves, either in stone or on papyrus or paper or whatever it might be, we now live in a time when Expertise is non-rivalrous, of course, but also the, our expressions of our expertise are also non-rivalrous. Um, so we can give expressions of our expertise without giving them away. So that gives us, um, when you can give things to people without having to give them away, that gives you a great capacity to share, um, a capacity that we haven't had before. And if that increases our capacity to share, then by definition, it increases our capacity to educate as well. So, so I think we think about the internet and about digital technology as increasi increasing the reach to people who can't come to our campus or people who can't be here at 10 o'clock because they have a job. Um, I think we think about it in some of these ways of convenience, but I think there's a much more important thing that uh, digital technologies let us do. Um, now, let me pause for a moment in parentheses and say that, yes, I know that education involves more than sharing copies of your expertise with people. It also involves having arguments with them and talking with them and explaining to them. Um, and it turns out the Internet is pretty good at helping us talk to people and argue with people and explain things to people. But, but that's not – that part of education isn't what I'm talking about right now. Right now I'm talking about – the content side. Let me let me pause for a minute and see if there are any questions or comments at this point. Please. If you don't say something, I'm just going to keep talking. So. Mm -hmm. There's such a dichotomy. How, how do you deal with that? Sorry. <laughs> how do you deal with plagiarism? How do you deal with this idea of that it's not okay to plagiarize without referencing, mm -hmm. and at the same time saying that we must share. We must share our expertise. And students interpret this in a different way. Yeah, so uh, that's how you deal with it. You have to deal with their interpretation. So it's all right? This idea. It's all well, right? Sure. Have, have you ever had a student who turned into you an absolutely original piece of work? Well, there's no original piece of work. I mean, like right. Einstein, we don't cite him every time we use his theory. But the whole idea of scholarship is to build right. on what others have said. Mm -hmm. But so therefore, there is no uh, copyright on ideas. 
but it's very difficult. It's a challenge to tell students, you don't just repeat what mm -hmm. others have done, but you need to put your own spin. Right. Yeah, they need to, they need to make they need to make some kind of original contribution to this conversation that's already going on, right? And that's part, I guess to me, that's part of the, cr the process of learning how to be uh, a scholar, you know, is learning how to understand that conversation that's been going on in time, maybe for 10 years, maybe for 150 years, maybe for 3,000 years, if you're talking uh, maybe a longstanding philosophical debate. How do you understand what's already happened how do you show that you understand what's already happened? And then how do you make your contribution to it? I don't think that that is a problem. I don't think that's a copyright-related problem, really. Unless, now, if students are just stealing other people's ideas and trying to represent them as their own, well, that's just immoral and inappropriate, and we should tell them to stop. Um, sharing ideas is important, and when, you, when you've been the recipient of that, you ought to reference who shared that idea with you and where you got it from. I think there is a culture of attribution that we have to help to establish. Um, both so that I know what's originally yours and what's not, but also so that I can see who are we, you know, whose conversation are you really participating in, right? Um, but I think the bulk of the problem you're talking about doesn't have anything to do with copyright. I think it has to do with just more basic ideas of representing your own work as your own and representing other people's work as other people's work. find chunks of you know what I've written mm -hmm. without attribution I get well, really annoyed and sure. then people say yeah but that's an idea that you can't copyright you know so these are problems especially with digital uh, technology well I mean w when someone if someone tries to pass off your idea as theirs that doesn't I mean you can't copyright ideas so this isn't a copyright related problem but when I mean, trying to take credit for work that's not your work is just not appropriate, and you shouldn't do it. But increasingly... Increasingly, people try to. Exactly. So, you know, how do you deal with it as a teacher? You penalize them, you take away their grades, you fail them out of school, you have academic honesty policies that tell them if they plagiarize, we're going to expel them from the program. Um, I mean, it's the standard kinds of things, I suppose. Um, that's a problem, but I don't think that's a... I don't think what we're talking about makes it better or worse. It's just as easy to copy somebody's work out of a book into your paper as it is to copy it off a web page into your paper. Um, I, d I don't think the digital part, the digital part might make it worse in that you have access to more information than you did in the past. But yeah, I, I think that's a slightly diff related but different issue. I think. Okay. Well, let's talk here for a minute about technology. Um, this new technology that does make it so that our, the expressions of our expertise are non-rivalrous. Um, technology never travels alone. It always travels with its companion, which is policy. Um, and there's a lot we can learn from history in this regard. And you may know this history better than I do, but let me give you a quick uh, sketch of uh, a story and then uh, a lesson we can draw out from it. The some would argue that the greatest technological advance in history right, happened in the 15th century, which is the combination of the printing press, not just with movable type, but with metallic movable type that you could use over and over again in the press. Right? Old movable type, the wooden type, wore out after you pressed on it so, for so long. Um, and the printing press and this metallic movable type, it gave us this great capacity to make copies of information and. Uh, at a rate that we never could before and more inexpensively than ever before. But at the same time that this technology evolved, we saw policy, uh, or in this case law, uh, evolving that was really, really strict with regard to some of the kinds of information that could be passed around. And I'm talking particularly about the Bible here. Um, Gutenberg's own master work is a copy of the Vulgate, the Latin Bible. It's a 42-line Bible that came off the press. Um, but the, the church itself didn't see the printing press as a way of providing greater access to God's word to the common people. The church saw the printing press as a way to do a variety of other things more efficiently, like printing indulgences. Um, indulgences being slips of paper you can buy that forgive, you know, give you forgiveness for your sins. Um, 
So instead of taking this technology and using it in a way that there is some demand from the people for, because at this point there's quite a demand for access to the scriptures, they start using it in another way, and policy starts to evolve. And this is English law from uh, 1414 is when this law became effective. So this isn't even about possessing a copy of the Bible. It's about reading the Bible in English. If you read the scriptures in the mother tongue, which in this case means English, you'll give up your land, your cattle, your life, and your goods, and not just yours, but also from your heirs, right? Your children, your family, everybody will die, will take everything you have, and will condemn you as a heretic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, the DMCA and ACTA and all these modern copyright treaties look really tame compared to this law, right? Um, so the... So what you have in the 15th century is this huge collision setting itself up where you have very powerful new information technology in the printing press giving you uh, great capability to disseminate information very broadly, very quickly, very inexpensively. You have big demand from people for the scriptures and in fact some of the first, uh, the fir some of the first times we talk about the word pirate with regard to information are pirated copies of the Bible that are being hidden in sacks of flour and hidden in bales of hay and transported across uh, uh, from one country into another. So you have technology and demand and outdated law, outdated ways of thinking reified in law. You have those things coming together in a collision. And of course, this collision is one of the main things, one of the primary causes, we would say, of the Reformation. Um, so taking that story as the lesson, I don't think our day is very different in terms of uh, new technology. You take something like the learning management system. Um, what, what learning management system do you use here at Walk? Are you, do you use Blackboard or WebCT no. or what? You have your own in-house system? I mean, a, a learning management system is really a technology that is kind of perverted and made to work against its own potential, right? Here's a digital platform with digital material that could, because it's digital, could be shared with everyone, but in many ways the point of the LMS is to conceal that information and to hide it and withhold it from people unless they've registered for class and paid their money and been admitted to university and all these kinds of things. Um, we have a joke. This is the Facebook page of my friend John Mott. He and I have a joke that says, if Facebook worked like your learning management system, then every 15 weeks Facebook would delete all your friends, delete all your photographs, delete all your groups. Because at the end of the class, you, when you're done with the class and you're kicked out, you can't get back to any of the material that was there before. All the discussion posts probably get deleted to make room for the new group of people who are coming in. We just delete everything on a regular basis. And that's... That's not a, a way to build a learning community by deleting all the work that they do every 15 weeks and keeping them from going back and accessing material after the end of the semester. Um, and while, while this may not be an issue all the time at, at WOC, it's an issue at other universities. You hear now of faculty who have policies that say, you cannot have the lids to your laptop open during class. Oriel, please, close your lid. Because if you keep it open, you're going to be on Facebook or something, and you're not going to be paying attention to me. And it's all about me. I need you right here with me. Everybody, me. Don't look at, don't look at your laptops. And because for some reason, faculty aren't willing to compete for attention. And, you know, if your email or if your Facebook about somebody having toast for breakfast, if that's more interesting than what's happening at the front of the room, you don't deserve their attention. But instead of actually trying to be more interesting, we, tell, we use policy. We say, no, you have to put your lids down. That's just kind of an outdated way of thinking. In fact, uh, two years ago, we had a case in the United States where a professor started suing some of his students because his students were taking notes during class and then posting them on the Internet or sharing them with each other. And the teacher said, I have the copyright to my class lectures. Your notes are derivative works of my copyrighted lecture material, and as the rights holder, I will control how they're used. 
I mean, it, if you cared that much about people making off with your ideas, why did you ever become a professor in the first place? You know, go work for a publisher. Go work for Elsevier or Springer or somebody. Right? Um, another comment, just very briefly, about the pace of change in education. So th this is an, it's not an actual photograph of Moses. It's an artist's rendition of Moses. Moses, um, we have recorded in the Bible, Moses tells the people that every seven years they should come together so that he can read the law to them. And they can, if they get together regularly and he reads it to them, they'll be able to remember it. And if they can remember the commandments better, then they can live them better. Um, this, I think, is the first recorded uh, evidence we have of lectures, right? Saying, I want you to come on a regular basis. I'll read to you from the textbook and you'll learn. This is quite a long time ago. Fast, I don't know, Moses is what, 1200, 1400 something BC? Fast forward ahead several years. This is a typical uh, early European university, supposedly. And you see, not a, you, know, you see the guy at the front, he's reading from the book to the class. Um, and the, the, the students who are really the rich students are sitting in the front. You can tell they're the rich ones because they've been able to purchase a copy of the book and bring it with them. Uh, and, and they're, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself in the story. They've been able to bring to class blank copies that they can take dictation in. Because at this point, the way that teaching works is the teacher reads very front, very slowly from the book and the students make their own copy of the textbook by hand because they can't afford to purchase one. Um, so we call this dictation. Now, after the printing press comes along, you would think if the entire university experience was about writing down the textbook by hand that the teacher's reading to you, then after the printing press, everything would change because you could buy your own copy of the book, right? Well, I if you look at these early copies of the Bible, you see there's no margin at all. The text comes all the way in and it goes all the way out to the page because you didn't want to waste paper. You wanted to print as much as you could on it. But after we, could print, after we could print books and printed books came into the university, faculty members said, well, what will I do now? I know what I'll do. And they started arranging for copies of books with wide margins to be printed. And the faculty member stood at the front and instead of reading the book, he read his annotations and his interpretations of the book. And you would write them down in the margin of your book. So even the invention of the printing press doesn't really change what happens in this room. He still sits at the front and reads and you still write things down. And now you fast forward another six, seven hundred years, and here we are at university with one person at the front. Here we are today at the walk with me at the front. I'm not reading from a book, I'm reading from a laptop, but this is essentially still exactly the same kind of instruction 3,000 years later. So take that as one block of comments. We've talked about new information technology, we've talked about some kind of outdated policy. Let's talk about demand for a minute. Um, Post-secondary or, or higher education, right now estimates are there are about 120 million people participating in higher education around the world. And in the next 20, 25 years, that number is projected to grow by another 150 million. Not from 120 to 150, from 120 to 270 million. Um, Sir John Daniel uses ex this example, which I think is a, a fabulous one. Basically translated, just in India, that means you have to build, staff, and open a new university every two weeks for the next 20 years or something in order to meet demand. Which means either we're not going to meet demand or we're going to have to radically change the way we do education. One of those two things. So again, this idea of the collision, right? Instead of the printing press now, it's the internet. We have this huge demand with people who are old enough and want higher education but can't get it now. And then we have these crazy outdated ways of thinking with not only these policies like put your lid down but also at the end of the course I'm going to boot you all out of the LMS and you won't be able to come back in. Um, and of course this all ought to sound very familiar. This is the story from the Reformation just retold a couple of hundred years later in education, which makes me wonder 
if we don't have our own kind of reformation coming. Um, and I don't know what is being written in the popular press here in Spain, but just last week in the U.S., a major newspaper ran a story called Plan B, Just Skip College. And the argument really wasn't whether or not you should do that. The argument was whether it should be Plan B or Plan A. You know, college is too expensive. You come out with too much debt. You don't learn anything you can actually use in the real world. You come out of college, get hired for a job, and they immediately begin training you again. So why not just skip college altogether? Which, I mean, when the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times writes an article like that, it's a little different from Luther nailing the theses onto the door of the church, but it's the same kind of, you know, it's the same kind of thing. So the question then I think becomes, the, the most interesting question becomes, will we reform our own institutions? Will we reform internally, like the church had a chance to do, but passed on? Um, or will we see the same kind of thing happen in education, which happened with the church, which is these different groups splitting off and trying to do things in, in more modern or more innovative or more appropriate ways, while that old institution kind of gets left behind for a small window of time? Um, so when you talk about reform, then you want to talk about examples of what reform is or what it might look like. Um, and I want to share with you one very, very imperfect example of, of uh, what reform might look like. Well, maybe we should pause here again and, and call for a question um, on this analogy of the Reformation and this lesson from history applied to modern higher education. Does anybody want to tell me I'm a big liar, or I've got it all wrong? Oriel? Uh, I just, just uh, wanted to contrast. The, the, you were showing some pictures that really made very, very clear the idea. Just saying, showing a girl, little girl, saying that's fine, yeah? Uh -huh. and, and when we see what, what means the property, copyright property and all that things, then you showed the the printing the first printer and you explain you showed about the Bible the for the the um, forbidden to to read the Bible in in a foreign language and it's curious to see that the printing just was discovered in a country where they first did is translate the Bible in their own nat nat uh, natural mm. la tongue thus the Bible was probably the the engine that made the printing possible because the first book they were printing was the Bible right mm. now in German yeah. Uh -huh. So there's always what I see, the, the conflict is, what do you pretend to do with your property? It's not that the people care about their property, they care about the use of their property. Mm -hmm. And I think here's the conflict. Here is, for example, in Spain we are paying a tax, even if we don't copy music, just for, for buying any engine that can copy uh -huh. information which is, I think, the most illegal law that has been written in Spain after Franco's death, because this is really, it's awful. It's against the most common sense that people cannot be just punished because yeah, they I'm could do one thing right. they are not doing. Right. But this is the concept. Who's pushing that? Mm -hmm. The big uh, broadcasting companies mm -hmm. who want to really speculate with property. They don't care a clue about the quality of the ideas, of the music, of everything. They just want to make big business with that. Mm -hmm. And here, I think, is the sin of the concept of intellectual property, is when you just want to speculate with that. You don't care about the use of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the opposite of what you're saying and the way people have to understand what's intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Because I, I always say, any musician should explain me that any part of his music doesn't belong to an original idea that his is not his. Right. And I can bid for that. I would win. Mm -hmm. So is he paying the rights to the owner of, of his original idea? No. Why shall I pay him the rights just to listen to his music? No, it's, it's more or less... Uh, yeah, and, and I'm not... I, I, I wish I could say one thing, but I can't, so I'll say another. Yeah, I, I wish I could say that I think eventually everyone in education will see that the more they share, the better education will be, and so they should share more. Um, not everyone will have that idea. Um, there will still be people who want to engage in IP speculation or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think 
eventually they'll have a very hard time competing competing with an education product that's very, very expensive. And because it's protected, I can't really see its quality. I can't get a preview of what it's like because I have to pay before I can. Where over here are many alternatives that are open whose quality I can inspect and I can look at before I decide to get involved. At, at some point, those open ones, at, at some point the closed one will have a very hard time competing with the open ones. Um, particularly in mathematics, it seems like a lot of scholarly books in mathematics uh, are shrink wrapped. You know, they're wrapped in plastic and you can't open them until you buy them. And I, have you ever seen, have you ever seen a book on a shelf like before you, it, that is, it's wrapped in plastic and you can't open it until you've paid for it? If there's a book right next to it on the same topic that you can pick up and look at and flip through, which one will you buy? I mean, you almost always, and especially these mathematics books, they cost like 100 euros or 150. I mean, they're really expensive. You're, you're betting a lot of money. And here's one that all you know is the cover and maybe who the publisher is. And here's one that you can go and look at the table of contents and read some pages. It's hard for the closed one to compete with the open one. It doesn't mean that the closed people will change their mind. It just means they'll probably go out of business eventually. Right? You, <laughs> you, you hope so, yeah. David, um, yeah, I agree with you. But the shrink-wrapped stuff, for example, in New Zealand are usually pornographic material. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go to a shop and find a mathematical or a communication book still wrapped up because I can go into the net and get the contents and see whether I want to buy it price, et cetera. But to pick up on Oriel's point and your point that um, openness is an ideal. We all believe in that as teachers, but the reality is so different because even within the university, even within a school, staff are made to compete with others, with PBRF, you know, all the government things of uh, research uh, competencies, etc. It makes staff really sort of almost like centurions of their knowledge, mm -hmm. and they are not willing to share mm -hmm. because of their own, the me, me, me stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and we are forced to actually accede to these ideas. Yeah, so I, I would I would lump that under this idea of outdated policy, out you know, old mode ways of thinking. Um, when you challenge, and you'll be kicked out of the university. You could be. You could be kicked out. Um, and I, th my very first year as a professor, when my tenure and promotion committee met, um, and they were explaining to me, you have to publish this many times a year, and you have to get this many grants, and you have to do this, that. Um, there's a person on my committee, uh, a very famous person named David Merrill. He's famous in our field. And... Um, he said to me, okay, so that's what it says all on paper. Now, let me explain to you how it really works. The way it really works is you should do whatever you want to do as a scholar. Do whatever you want to do. And at the end of six years, if the university looks at the work that you want to do and doesn't want to keep you here, then you don't want to stay here. If they don't value the work that you want to do, you should go somewhere else where you're a better fit. And I took that advice, you know. And for me, it worked out at the institution I was at. The kinds of things I wanted to do were the same kinds of things the institution valued. But if you want to do something very different from what's valued at the institution where you work, you probably should find a new institution to work at, I, I guess I would say. I'm afraid that uh, because the knowledge is just getting outdated so easily, so fast, so quick, Challenging today is not so easy. I mean, it's harder to find a person who's ready to make from an idea a new one uh -huh. than someone who can copy. So I don't feel challenged that someone uses an idea of mine if I've been ready to build it up because I am ready to build a new one. Uh -huh. So and he will not. That is that what we call know-how in the companies. And I think that makes the difference from one company to the other. If the company is made the way that this company can innovate on and on and the other one can only copy on and on. Mm -hmm. So there will be every time a bigger uh, split or a bigger distance between both because one is heading much faster and the other one is just 
following after. Mm -hmm. And th this is probably what would explain what advantage you can take just by sharing. Because by sharing, and this uh, on the social networks analysis explains very easily, by sharing you can build uh, links to other networks and get information that normally in a closed network you cannot get. Mm -hmm. And this makes you more uh, prone to get information that normally you wouldn't be, and with that if you can manage the, all this, you are more powerful, you're, ma you're stronger, so you don't have to care about people copying your ideas. And this is for, for me, if we have to think on challenging, this would be the answer that I would give. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of challenges, thank you for that nice transition into the next section of my uh, talk. Um, I guess many of you have heard of Ben Bloom. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy is you know, very uh, famous in the field of education. Um, a, a little bit lesser, well, less popular part of Bloom's work was around this idea of two sigma. Sigma is the letter we use to represent the standard deviation in statistics. Um, and uh, Bloom and his colleagues did quite a bit of work. There's one paper from 1984 in particular that's quite famous. And in, in this series of studies, they compared students in a classroom who are be being taught in what we would consider a traditional way and stu students who were very much like those students in the classroom who were taken and instead of being taught in class were taught by a tutor. One on one or maybe one on two by a tutor. And they compared the, the amount that the students who learned in the, class, uh, in the classroom learned with the amount learned by the students who were tutored. And what they found is that the average student who received tutoring learned about two standard deviations more than the average student in the classroom. Or another way of saying that is that the, of all the students who were tutored, and we assume they're in some kind of bell-shaped distribution, the average student who was tutored learned more than 98% of students in the classroom, the average tutored student. Or in other words, the, the average student is capable of learning a lot more than they learn in the classroom if we gave them some more effective instruction. Now, tutoring is very expensive. You know, it, it's already hard to, particularly right now in the current budget climate, it's hard to hire enough teachers to teach classes of 30 or 40 or 500 or something. Imagine trying to pay for one teacher for every student. It's very, very expensive. So we teach class instead. In, in this paper by Bloom, um, he said, you know, so they've demonstrated this two sigma effect. He says if the, the research on this two sigma problem could yield practiced methods, in other words, methods that the average teacher can use, that they can learn in a very brief period of time, and that don't cost more money or time than what they used to do, that would be an educational contribution of the greatest magnitude. If we could increase student learning so much with an average teacher with very little difference in cost. Um, so for a number of years we've been asking if we should, should we tutor or should we not? Should we use intelligent tutoring systems and artificial intelligence and whatever or not? There's been this question, uh, particularly in the educational technology field, you know, which should we do? And this idea that you have to only do one or the other I think is a false question. Um, so a question that, uh, an approach that we've become very interested in is what we call strategic tutoring. In other words, you tutor every student, but you only tutor them when they need to be tutored, and you only tutor them about the thing that they need to be tutored about. Because when I'm tutoring you one-on-one, -on -one, chances are 80% of what I'm teaching you, you would have understood just from reading the book. I'm only, a tutor is only acting as a tutor when they're tutoring. Does that make sense? I hope. I'm not sure it made sense even for English speakers. I don't know. So this idea of doing strategic tutoring, if you think about it, it requires at least three things. One, it requires you to have a very, very deep amount of insight and understanding of what the student, you know, who, who needs help, when do they need help, what do they need help about. That's a lot of information that generally we don't have. Um, and so data, of course, are the key to having that kind of insight. 
you need you don't need uh, all of these the kind of data that you normally get in a class we jokingly refer to as autopsy data. Does anybody know what what autopsy is in Spanish? Auto hey, very good. My, my Spanish is great. Okay. You know, we call it autopsy data, right? Because the class is over, the student's gone, there's nothing you can do for them. But now we have some data about how their learning went, right? But to do this kind of work, to do this kind of strategic tutoring, you need live data. You need data from one second ago. You know, how's the student doing? What are they doing? And the, the third observation related to this, of course, is that Data are expensive, but good data are really, really expensive, right? And who, who on earth can afford to gather and analyze data like this? Well, let me give you a few examples of some people who can afford to gather and use this kind of data. So Google is one. Um, at the top here, uh, in English anyway, I, I've misspelled the word football in the Google search box. And then just underneath there in red, it says, did you mean, and it's suggesting the new spelling to me. <laughs> now, Google doesn't do that by going to a dictionary, right? What Google does is they track who does what, when, and what order. And it turns out that after people type in this word here, the very next word they normally come back and type in is this next word. So they haven't used a dictionary or a spell check. They've just got so much data that they said, uh, people who type that immediately come back and type this other thing. So we think you meant this other thing. Okay, it's not, ba it's not based on dictionaries at all. Um, Amazon.com. I guess many of you have bought a book from Amazon or a book or a DVD player or something, right? And whenever you go back to Amazon, it says, hey, we think you'd like to buy this book. Because other people who bought books like you uh, also liked this kind of book. It takes a lot of data to generate a recommendation like that. Um, anyone in here play World of Warcraft? No? No. Anyway, yeah, this is, that's almost unintelligible. This, this is a room in a virtual world with about 100 or 150 people standing in it. They're getting ready to go on a raid. And, um, the companies that run these servers, you know, that run the World of Warcraft server, or the EverQuest server, or whatever server it is, are gathering all kinds of data. Just like, you know, Amazon is gathering, every time you look at a book, every time you click on a book and go look on it, they capture that. How long did you look at it for? They capture that. What else did you look at at the same time? You looked at these three books within five minutes. They must be related to each other somehow, because you looked at all of them within five minutes, of, right? They're just... Every time you click, when, where, what order, how long, they're capturing all that data. Same thing in Warcraft, right? Where did you go? Who did you talk to? How long were you there? Which quest did you go on together? Um, is, is, do you have Netflix in Spain or, or some equivalent of this? What's the Spanish equivalent of Netflix? Do, do you have one? Tinatube. Okay, and you can, or, or down, or can you get a DVD as well? I mean, the way Netflix worked originally was they would sit, you went on and said, I want this movie, and they would email you, I mean, they would mail you a DVD physically. And then when you're done with it, you send it back, and they send you the next one, and then when you send it back, they send you another. Um, for, for about a year now, I guess, you've been able to stream movies out of Netflix, but it started out as DVD rental company, but it was all by mail. And based on which movies you rented and checked out, then they would recommend other movies to you. So, you know, in the case of Netflix, in the case of Amazon, in the case of World of Warcraft, in the case of Google, you know, every single interaction you have is being captured and being tracked and all that information is being bundled up and analyzed in some way so they can improve the service that they provide to you. Um, in fact, I don't know if you have these in Spain or not, but in the United States, at the grocery store, when you go to buy milk and bread and eggs and whatever else, they have a little card, and you carry the card with you, and if you scan the card, then they'll give you a 5% discount or you know, something like this, right? Well, why are they willing to give you a discount? They give you a discount because when you scan your card, now they know that you are the person who bought milk and eggs, and, and they're gathering data. 
and they're using all that data to do a whole bunch of things. Like if it turns out that people always buy milk and bread together, then maybe in the store it would be really convenient if we put the milk and bread next to each other. Or if I know you're always going to buy milk and bread together, maybe I should put the milk in the back corner of the store and the bread in the front corner of the store so I can make you walk all the way through the store and you'll pick up other things, right? But once they understand what you're doing, they can use that effectively. So I would argue that every industry in the world, even the guy who's selling milk and eggs and bread, is using data better than we in education are using data. They're gathering more, they're analyzing it more, they're storing it longer, they're doing a better job. So let me try to connect the dots here once and then I'll connect the bigger dots in a minute from this idea of two sigma to strategic tutoring into data. You know, how can we as educators get the same kind of data that Google or that Amazon uh, or that World of Warcraft is able to have. Um, one way to do it is to do school online. Walk knows a little something about this, right? Yes. About doing school online. Because if we do school online, then every single interaction that a student has involves a click. And if it involves a click, then we can capture it. And if we can capture it, then we can store it. And if we can store it, we can analyze it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the homepage of a, a new school in Utah called the Open High School. Um, it's a school that I'm involved with that is a completely online high school. There's no building. Um, all the classes happen online. And we uh, are, have gotten very, very serious about this idea of capturing data. So just as an example of some of the kind of data that, that we can capture, you know, when students logged in, when they read, when they worked, how long they were logged in, how long they were reading, what pathway did they take, you know, did they take the assessment before they looked at the content, did they take the content out of order. For every single test item that they took, we, you, know, you can do item response theory, you can do all kinds of analytics on that. So we've tried to develop this teaching model that we call, you know, we keep using this phrase strategic tutoring, where we have a curriculum that's online that the students use, and the hope is that, you know, I, like I said before, maybe the curriculum itself can do 80% of the teaching or some percentage of the teaching, but then the teachers reach out proactively to the students to provide tutoring to them when they need it about what they need it about. So the way the teacher's morning works is the teacher opens up her laptop. All of our teachers are women right now. Teacher opens up her laptop and logs into the system and the first thing she sees is a dashboard with a list of students on it. And the, the student at the top is the student that the system thinks is in the most need of help. And then the next student listed is the one in the next most need of help. And the teacher just spends her whole day getting on the phone or getting on Skype or whatever, tutoring students. And you tutor the one student until you get whatever the problem is fixed and then you go to the next one and you go to the next one and you just, all they do is tutor all day long. Sometimes, of course, the student will pick up the phone and call and say, I'm confused, I need some help. But mostly it's the teacher reaching out to the student. Um, I guess many of you know that in the field of educational technology for a long time, they've, there's been an effort to develop intelligent tutors or software-based tutors where the computer is the one that's tutoring you. Um, so you might say, why not take that approach? Well, there's a very interesting article uh, written by Gary Kasparov, the, um, the world, whatever, at one time, you know, the number one ranked chess player in the world, um, about a contest in 2005 on this website called, uh, I think it's called playchess.com. And there are lots of websites where you can go to play chess against other people. And most of these websites have anti-cheating technology built in to try to keep you from you know, using a computer, using something, using a chess playing computer over here while you're playing with your uh, chess partner over the internet. But in 2005, they did a contest where they said, you can do anything you want. You can play in teams, you can use a computer, you can do anything. And they put up a ton of money for the, for the person or the team that won this big chess competition. So everyone immediately thought, 
you know, well, you're going to get this grandmaster chess player, and that grandmaster chess player is going to have some kind of supercomputer, chess supercomputer, and they're going to work together to play, and they're going to win the contest. Well, the, the, they found two things. One that didn't surprise anyone was that a human and a computer working together could beat the computer every time. Um, but the lesson that they learned that they didn't expect to learn, th the, it turns out the people that won the contest were two amateur chess players. They were teenagers, and they were using three laptop computers. They, they weren't chess geniuses, and they weren't using supercomputers. But they had figured out a good process for working with the computers to teach the computers about the game, to get good feedback from the computer. And Gary Kasparov in, in this article says, the lesson is that a weak human being and a weak computer and a good process beats a strong human being, a strong computer, and a poor process. So a grand master chess player and a supercomputer if they don't have the process figured out right, lose to two, teen two teenagers and a couple of laptops. Right. And I think that, is, that story, I think, is a lot, tells a lot about what we're trying to do at the high school. That instead of some supercomputer intelligent tutoring system, you know, we have a computer running, you know, the, these data that we're gathering are running on a very standard kind of server, and our teachers are licensed teachers, but they're kind of, normal teachers, but I think we have this good process. So another benefit of data is that it gives you the opportunity to improve your curriculum materials. Because instead of just at getting to the end of semester and saying, hey, how did that class go? You know, I think next time when I teach that class, it seemed like everybody struggled in week four. I think I'm going to do something different in week four next time. I'm going to try something new. Um, you know, very large-scale generalizations, not very specific, because you haven't, you generally don't gather a lot of data when you teach these kinds of classes. Um, but when you have lots of data, <coughs> excuse me, when you have lots of data, the data can make very specific recommendations to you, thank you, about, um, you know, about what kinds of changes you might need to make. Um, but data telling you what you should change, of course, isn't enough. You also have to have permission to make changes to your curriculum materials. If they're protected by copyright, maybe you're not permitted to revise them. Right? So the data, you could be gathering all kinds of data and it could may be making all kinds of recommendations to you, but copyright might keep you from implementing those. So the idea of the open high school of Utah is that the high school only uses curriculum materials that have an open license. Um, and because we only use curriculum materials with an open license, then we know we have the permission to make changes and revisions and improvements anytime we need to. Um, it would be easier and faster to just go buy a commercial curriculum, but then when we found problems with it, we'd be stuck. We couldn't make it better. So I thought, ooh, I keep hitting this mic. So, I'm flying all over the place up here. We talked about these four R permissions before. You know, these are the kinds of things, particularly, I think, of interest to us are you know this idea of revise and improve and also redistribute, um, because we we have, we're really keen to see other high schools pick up and use these curriculum materials. And so, in fact, um, not only have we made a commitment, but in the charter documents that were written by the high school and submitted to the state, and that the state approved so that we could open our high school, we committed ourselves to exclusively using OER. Um, so kind of, if we're, gonna st if we're gonna keep our contract with the state in effect, we can only use openly licensed materials. So this is important because this, this idea, I, I have a graphic here in a second, actually maybe I should show it first. You know, this idea of the loop, or, or the feedback loop. I know you asked me not to do this, but I'm gonna move. I'm going to stand here so I can point it out to you because, you know, you start with curriculum materials that are openly licensed that either you found on the internet somewhere from MIT OpenCourseWare or wherever, or you made your own that you then immediately put an open license on. You start with materials and those materials get used by students. 
when students use those materials, it generates all kinds of data. It generates data about how they use them, what time of day they use them, how long they use them, but also assessments generate data like how long did it take them to finish this item, did they get it right or not, if they got partial credit, how much credit did they get. These data about how the student is doing can come over here to support the strategic tutoring. This is how the dashboard knows what order to put students in because this data allows it to make these recommendations to teachers. But these data also tell you how your curriculum is doing. You know, if, if everybody looks at this one piece of content for three hours and then they all fail the assessment that was associated with it, that's a problem with this piece of content. But so this data then can feed back into redesigning your curriculum materials. And so you get this big loop just flowing. You, you all know about feedback in a microphone, right? When the speaker is too close to the microphone, then the sound coming out of the speaker goes in and it comes out and it just gets loud and you want to hold your ears and scream. Um, in English, we call that feedback, which is oddly enough, feedback is the same term we use for what we tell students about how they're doing with their homework and things like this. This is a feedback loop, right? This should make our curriculum get, well, it should simultaneously mo make both our curriculum get better and it should make our students learn more because their curriculum is getting better, but also because it's helping us know when they need help and when to reach out to tutor them and tutor them. Now, I'm really close to the end. I'm sorry I'm holding you here for so long. Um, but you'd say, well, the tutoring happens outside the system. There's no clicking involved with the tutoring. So what do you do with that? Um, we use uh, some software. The, the, the category of software is called customer relationship management. And so um, if you've ever had an experience where I know none of your computers have ever broken or ever had a problem, but sometimes my computer has a problem. And sometimes the problem is so bad that you have to call someone. And so you call them and you talk to them about it. And then three days later, you call back. And they say, you know, give me your name or number or whatever. And they say, oh, yeah, I see that you called three days ago. You had this kind of, you know, they know a little bit about who you are because they've captured information about you in one of these systems. So this isn't a screenshot of our copy of the system um, because our copy of the system would have all kinds of private student information in it. And I wouldn't put it up on the screen. But this is a screenshot from the company that provides the system that's uh, it's called HiRise. It's very inexpensive. I think we pay $15 a month for it, I think. But basically, in this kind of system, you can see a name and a person up here at the top. Every person has a page in the system, and everyone who can log into the system can add notes and can add information to this page. You can email. You can send emails to the page that get attached to it there. So basically, every time one of our teachers has a tutoring session with a student, if it happens by Skype, they just cut and paste the tutoring session into here. Or if it's a phone call, then they make a summary of the conversation in here so that every time any teacher has any interaction with a student that happens outside the system, some information about that interaction gets captured here specific to the student. So I can go to a student's page and see exactly who they've talked to and what they talked about and how often that happened. So from time to time, when you run a high school, you get a call from someone's parent, and the parent's really angry because the, you know their kid failed a test, but my kid's too smart to fail a test, but he failed it. So there must be some problem with your teaching, or your test must be bad, or you know, they call and they yell at you, and they say, you know, my kid was online all day, every week last week studying. And the teacher goes and looks at the system and says, well, I believe he was online all day last week, but he must have been playing Warcraft because I can tell you he only spent 37 minutes in English. And when you can say that to the parent, then the fight is over. Now the parent goes and fights with their kid. <laughs> you were online, you know, why weren't you studying? And then that conversation that the teacher has with the parent goes into the system for the student, right? So all that information is captured. So when the math teacher reaches out to you on Tuesday and says, you haven't been logging in enough. I can see you're falling behind. I'm really worried. What, what can I do to help you get involved? Then on Wednesday, when the, when the math teacher calls the parent, then on Thursday, when the English teacher calls the parent, and the parent says, 
oh gosh, I didn't realize Bobby wasn't studying enough. Then the English teacher says, no, I know the math teacher talked to you about this yesterday. All right, so don't try to play games with me and tell me that you didn't know. So a couple of last points here. When you have all this data, it, it's so hard to interpret. So we need ways to make pictures of the data so we can look at it. Let me show you one. Um, this is a visualization of first semester data from the high school. This says 0 and 99, but it's not to scale. It just means lower and higher here. Each row in this graph, each row of little drops of water is a student. So this is one student, this is one student here. They're sorted from top to bottom according to their average grade in all of the classes that they took. Okay, so these are the students with the highest average grade. These are the students with the lowest average grade. Left to right is time. This is August through January. So each column is a day. Okay, so each column is a day. Each row is a student. And then the darkness of the drop tells you how much time they spent in the system that day. We call this the waterfall. Um, because you can see you can see some fairly interesting things like here's Christmas holiday. Okay. Here's Thanksgiving holiday. This is in November. You can see weekends here like little rocks at the top that are just stopping the water from coming down, right? But what you also see is that the students with the best grades are very consistent about coming into the system. And they're very consistent about spending a good amount of time in the system. There's not a single student doing poorly that comes consistently into the system and spends lots of time. If you're coming consistently and spending lots of time, you're doing okay. But if you're not coming, or you know, if you're never here at all, and then at the end you try to work really hard, you know, it's just not going to cut it. So this is just one quick visualization, you know, but you think about what goes into this data, right? Every day, and on that day, how much time? You know, by student, over the semester, final grade. Um, so we use this, you know, when students are interested in coming to our school, say, gosh, I'd like to go to online high school because, you know, then I could, you know, only work two or three days a week, and I'd just work for a couple hours, it'll be... I'm sure you've heard these things at walk, right? Oh, online learning, I, you know, I'll spend an hour in the middle of the night and it'll be fine. I'll just do okay. But you can show them this and say, look, no, you won't. <laughs> if you don't spend any time, you'll do poorly. If you don't come consistently, you'll do poorly. If you want to do well, you need to come regularly and you need to spend a good amount of time, right? And because it's based on actual data from the students in the high school, they know that it's the real deal. You know, it's not just you lecturing them saying, oh, you should work harder or something. So data make it easy to tell pretty powerful stories. So the school just finished its first year. Um, of course our students, after only one year, we haven't worked all the bugs out of the system, but we are still pretty aggressively pursuing this idea of if we do this tutoring thing correctly, we ought to be able to get our students learning a lot more than students in the normal classroom do. So. Let me make two summary remarks. This talk was supposed to be about the future of education, I think, and about openness and about data. I think those two things are in the title. So I hope that in the example of the high school, I hope that I showed how the data part of it and the openness part of it are related and how you need them both. Because the data are very powerful, but the data will recommend all kinds of things to you that you're not allowed to do unless the resources you're using are open. And the open resources are great because you can modify them and adapt them and revise them, but you don't know how to modify and adapt and revise them if you don't have the data. Right? So those two things, in my mind, go together very nicely and are very powerful and I think will be important to the future of education. So the two last comments then. First, another, time, uh, another question that you'll hear, particularly from students in our programs is, Gosh, what's, what's really the, what's the proper role of technology in education? And to me, I think the answer is very simple. I think the proper role of technology is to help us be more open. Um, yeah, maybe I won't say anything more.
the proper role of technology is to help us be more open. Because I think the more open we are, the more opportunities we have to share, the more opportunities our students have to access information, and the more opportunities we have to revise and adapt and improve, the more open we are, the better education can be. And because this is the path of improvement, I think it's the path that's going to run in the future. So that's the end of the talk. So questions about the last section of the talk about the, the strategic tutoring model and the data piece and things like that. Julia. Oh, you need the mic, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, it was interesting, really interesting. Thank you for your talk. And in fact, at uh, the Open University of Catalonia, we have been gathering data from our students. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I'm afraid I cannot be so um, positive in the sense that being online doesn't mean uh, learning. Mm -hmm. In the sense that we know, for example, that our students, they go online, they download everything, then they print it, and they uh, learn offline. So, uh -huh. uh, of course, good students spend more time in our virtual campus than bad ones. Mm -hmm. But it's not, I don't see, or it's not clear what is the cause and what is the effect. So mm -hmm. it's like being online makes you a better student, or maybe you are a better student, and then uh, you go more online. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's not that simple. And I, w I would agree with that completely. So yeah. uh, I like this idea of uh, visualizing data in order mm -hmm. to, to have a, a general, but I think that every single dot th th can mean uh, a lot of things, uh, oh, yeah. different things. So, mm -hmm. Because I don't know, but you can open a session and then go for a coffee and then yeah. uh, the session has been open for 10 minutes. And or three days. Or exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's not that easy in the sense that it's, no, it's a useful tool, but it's really mm, noisy and mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And yeah, so wh while recognizing that there is a lot of noise in it, you'll see that there's, there's nobody near the top that's not consistently there. You know, I mean, I agree that there's a lot of noise in it, and you can go for a coffee, and you can do these kinds of things. Um, you know, I don't know if you can see or not. There's kind of a, a blank line right here, but they're just they're faint dots. That person's there every day, but they're there a shorter period than the others. You know, th there's nobody that does well that doesn't spend time. Not, now, I think that's probably all that you can really say definitively, right? The people that do well complete all the assignments. They complete them on time, and that means doing some work every day. But at, at the same time, you don't see anybody doing really poorly who's there every day spending a lot of time, right? So, I mean, they're just general comments you can make, but they're still really useful comments to be able to make, you know? I mean, uh, I don't know... Uh what your students do on that system. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot compare it to our ours. Probably not. Because, no. uh, in fact, our virtual campus, I would say, is just a communication arena. Hmm. Uh, students interact with each other, with the students. There are some online tools, but I think that mostly they are online for communicating, downloading resources, and, and that's all. So we did a similar uh, study on our students. Uh -huh. And in fact, uh, what we discovered is that uh, there was no a strong relationship between time online and degrees, for example. Mm. So Interesting. But uh, what we saw is that when our students are with us like in the fifth, sixth, or seventh semesters, they learn to be online learners. Mm -hmm. So they perform better. So they yeah. need some time. And I mean, there are so many variables uh, involving uh, that. Yep. It's not that I don't like it. I mean, I really like it. But what I mean is that time cannot be the only uh, yeah. measure of the of the system. No. Because it's even if you uh, can see more black dots in the top and white in the bottom, uh, uh, you can cheat the system, for example, and things like that. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if all you needed was time, then you, would, you wouldn't have to gather lots of data and you wouldn't have to analyze lots of data. You'd just gather time and you'd be done, exactly. right? <laughs> right? I mean, for this particular, this is one example, you know, that uses time that uh, I think is, is really useful to us in the recruiting and kind of marketing phase when people are trying to decide, you know, if they should come to our school or go somewhere else because people think they can be this kind of student 
and do well, you know, and it helps us show them that they can't. And that's really kind of the biggest use that we make of this particular visualization, you know. So, but yeah, there's tons of other data, tons of other ways to analyze it. I just haven't brought them with me. Uh, David, thank you for your enriching presentation. It's been very, very, I mean, I have learned a lot. I was just wondering about what you were saying about the Bloom Sigma <laughs> theory. I think it was written in times where people didn't have virtual classrooms. And I guess, I guess uh, much of what it's saying about the knowledge that students can get in classrooms, in virtual classrooms, changes a lot. Especially because much of the information you collect in the classroom about the communication of different students is available at the classroom, what in presential classrooms mm -hmm. is not possible to have. So I'm sure that uh, what we could say networked or collaborative learning, what George Simmons liked to call as connectivism, is in, in virtual education and e-learning more a, a factor to take in account and can be as decisive as a tutoring, a good tutoring, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. at least we shouldn't forget that. I mean, I'm not uh, sure if you agree with that or not. Yeah, well, the, um, I, I think the point of the Two Sigma work, wherever it was, somewhere on here, anyway, um, the point of the Two Sigma work is that the the difference between the amount students learn when they're tutored and the amount they learn in the classroom is so large. I mean, two standard deviations is a huge amount, right? Um, I, I, I think the point of the two sigma work is to say, look how much more, this much more, they're capable of learning, right? But I, I don't think I hear anyone arguing that in online settings, students learn this much more than they do in the classroom. In fact, I think there are lots of studies that show it's very similar amount that they learn. Some studies show a little gain for online. Some show a little gain for classroom, maybe depending on the bias of the author of the study. Um, but I, I don't see anything claim, making this big claim for online the way that Bloom did for tutoring. So I, I guess that's the, a difference I would see. Uh, tutoring is something that is more professor student uh -huh. and I think we are talking more about informal learning about learning in collaboration so uh, the another student can be your tutor mm -hmm. and you don't need a professor to be that because part of what you're learning and it's been shown that many times uh, uh, colleagues can help you more than the professor mm -hmm. so uh, it's another way of understanding tutoring I guess yeah so I don't think that I don't think it's important that a teacher be the tutor necessarily um, I think this is, this is the Kasparov lesson, that, that a weak human and a weak computer with a good process can be better. So my question then would be, what's that process? You know, a, a lot of times, um, so uh, George and Stephen have taught these, what they call massively open courses. I've taught them before, you know, where basically we have a hundred or a thousand people and they all have their blogs and we've made all these ways for, their com for them to communicate with each other. But... Um, but at the end of the day, how do I know that she needs tutoring right now? And how do I find her? And can we even connect? You know, it's, it's that process part that I think is so important to understand. And if there were a system capturing every time you logged in, every time you logged out, everything you read, how you, how you were doing on the assessments, would you feel comfortable sharing all that information with everybody so that somebody that was willing to volunteer to be your tutor you know, could really tutor you effectively? I think a lot of people would if they felt like somebody was going to use it effectively to support them in their learning, but a lot of people would just get creeped out by it, you know, and uh, would never want that. It, it takes a lot of, I think part of that process is uh, access to a lot of data. Um, because I know, um, as we've talked to the teachers who teach at this online high school, they say, I'm spoiled, I'm done, I'm ruined. I can never ever teach in a classroom again. Because I just stand and I look and I have no idea, you know, I mean, you're looking at me, but are you thinking about what I'm saying? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. Are you reading your homework at night? I don't know if you even opened the book or not. I just don't know anything when I stand in front of the classroom except maybe the score that they get on their test. 
now I'm used to having access to all of this information about when and how long and in what order and all these kinds of things, I can never ever go back to the classroom again. Um, so I, I guess I'm being a good professor and taking five minutes to agree with you, right? When I should just say I agree and shut up, but I have to talk for a long time because I'm a faculty member. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely possible that a peer could tutor you as effectively. The question is, how would they, how would that process work? How would they know everything they needed to know in order to show up when you actually needed to be tutored? Um, and maybe you would say, well, because you would ask for help. But a lot of times you need help when you don't even know that you need help. You don't know to ask for it. Um, so the weak human plus weak computer plus better process wins. Uh, the Kasparov lesson, the, all the magic happens inside that better process box. You know, what goes on inside there is, is something I think we ought to be working to understand. Well, um, as I have the microphone now, I wanted to make <laughs> 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 well, two comments which are quite different. One was uh, concerning the, uh, the reform, now this uh, necessity that we have to, to educate plenty of million of people that are not educated now. One, well, we might th think, okay, maybe the, the universities are not, should not be like they are anymore, and we should think how they should change and all this. But probably the, the thing is that knowledge and who has it is, is a valuable thing that makes us different from the person next to us, right? Mm -hmm. from, from since the oracles, the person that managed to talk to the oracles was, you know, a, an important right. guy. Then it was the rich. Now it's the first world, probably, with uh, respect to, to third world or developing world, but okay, if everyone is coming here, no, where is the, our difference and how will we we'll differentiate? Because at the end, this is what brings us to the best jobs. And so I, I think it's more than changing just the universities mm -hmm. or the teaching system or the educational system. And I don't know if we are ready for that. I mean, not we, the academics or the faculty or the universities, but everyone, I mean, I think it's a big, big change. So that was one comment. And the other was about data and this process. I agree that uh, good processes help a lot, but I think, and I don't know if we have the time and or we want to do that. Huh? I mean, this analyzing the data makes things better, but at the end, sometimes I think we tend to look for the, for a moment to stop looking at data, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, I analyze it, now I know how to do it, now I make a process, and now I repeat the process because this allows me to, instead of teaching to 100 to 1,000, right? And this, with a process, you can do it much better. But it's a bit the perversion of the system, right? Because at the end, you don't, you don't do it better because you think you did it very well. And probably this data-based uh, tutoring, strategic tutoring, or however you call it, should be like a continuous interpretation of the data because mm -hmm. people will change the way they interpret technology and knowledge. And all. This will change, right? So, I don't know, sometimes I think that these processes are a, a bit like a, a trap, you know, but you get trapped there and it's quite tough to get out. And here, as Julia was saying, we, we have been looking at data and, and creating plenty of processes and this makes us grow. So, it's thanks to, apart from many other people working, eh? <laughs> but of course, this, this helps us a lot, but sometimes it, it already starts now, no? that personalization, a bit of... Uh, we lose a bit of human human touch because you know the process helps us a lot, but it's more automatic and not. Uh, so I don't know if at the end, I mean, if this really will, I don't know how to say it. If we will be able to really continuously improving, I mean, I don't know. Because you won't be able to continuously Im improve because at some point you'll hit a ceiling and you won't be able to do any better? Wh no, wh why will you not be able to get better? get tired because at the end... Because <laughs> you get tired. Well, yeah, I mean, because this is quite, I mean, it, it asks a lot of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> All the time. yeah, yeah, it does. Um, right or, I mean, and and so, I, so I guess having good process, you know, is really important. I, I've heard, I've only heard secondhand, I hope to hear it directly eventually, but I, I've heard comments from um, parents and from students at our high school saying that they never had this much contact, never had this much help, never had this much support from their teachers at the real school. You know, because that, they're with them physically, but they're with 30 of them, and when does a teacher in a real school get to pull a person aside and spend 15 minutes just with them 
helping them on the thing that they need help with. You know, maybe once or twice in a one hour period and then that group leaves and the next group comes, whereas, um, you know, in, in the open high setting, that's all the teacher does all day long is have one-on-one, -on -one very personal tutoring kinds of interactions with students. And I, I've heard a couple of comments. We haven't done a big survey yet. We're hoping to do that this summer. But it seems to me like the sentiment from the students is that they feel like they have a lot more personal contact with the faculty. They know them a lot better and they feel like they care about, they feel like the faculty care about them more than the faculty in their classroom schools did. So I, I guess the, the fir my first response would be the whole goal here is to make it more personal and not just personalized by an automated system, to make it more personal where you're getting more of the time that you need with a human being. Because I, I don't believe, I sort of don't believe in the whole intelligent tutoring kind of paradigm. I mean, I've seen studies where it shows it has some effectiveness, but every one of you, when you call the tech support for your computer or whatever, and it says, to use our automated system, press one. To speak with a support engineer, press two. You never, ever press one. Ever. I mean, at that point where you've given up and you want help, you want to talk to a human being now. And the fact that you can't get to a human being drives you crazy and you're on hold for 45 minutes and you, I just want to talk to a person, you know. I think we've all had that feeling. And so the, the fact that this, at least the design goal of the, of the system is for them to spend more time talking personally with a teacher, you know, than they would have been able to before. And it seems like that part of it's working. I mean, I, I know one path toward personalization is to automate everything. I think we're trying to automate a lot of things. I think we're trying to automate figuring out who needs help today. But then at that point, a person steps in, and it's the person that does the, you know, does the helping. I, my other comment to your comment about the reform, is, it was very interesting to me. Um, Chuck Vest, who was the the president of MIT when they started their open courseware project. Um, among other things that he went on and did later, one of them was he joined the US's uh, Commission on National Competitiveness. And it seemed to me that if the US really wanted to keep its competitive position in the knowledge economy, the very last thing we would do is publish open courseware, right? Because it's, it's a knowledge economy, it's all about knowledge. So if we want to be the best, and we're thinking about it in terms of competing with other countries, we should never share anything we find out with them. That's how we could keep our competitive advantage. But he, after being the president who went around and did the fundraising and launched OpenCourseWare, then went and joined that commission. And I know it must make sense in his head somehow, but I've never been able to make it make sense in mine. I, I don't think... I don't think you can think about openness and sharing and really have that kind of feeling and at the same time feel like you need to compete with other people on the basis of knowledge. I mean, if you work harder than they work, then you should win. You know, work is a rivalrous resource. If I'm working for you, I can't work for you or whatever. So if I'm going to try harder and work 18 hours a day, that's one thing. But if I'm sharing my ideas and sharing what I know, I, I don't know. So I. I Again, I guess I'm taking a long time to try to agree with you. I, I'm not sure how that works. If you feel like you need to compete on the grounds of knowledge, why would you ever get involved in open educational resources or open education? I don't think you would. I think if you make a commitment to OCW or OER or something like that, you're saying, my value is somewhere else. It's in some other service that I provide. It's not just in those contents. I don't know. It's a, it's a really interesting yeah, question. This might be one of the reasons why many OER projects fail, because there is no real trust on this, you know? Because sometimes I, I feel like it's, it's a fashionable thing, so mm -hmm. we all want to do that. But if you don't really trust it, you don't really reform, right? right? So they don't work. I mean, it's just another thing there. But it's it's not really implemented. You didn't prepare all the th all the processes, all the things right. around you, so they will fail. I mean, it's not a problem of OER or whatever. I mean, it's right. it's a problem that you don't believe in that, right? Right, right. So in the 
what, in the 1990s, I guess, in the U.S., at our universities and in many of our companies, we had these big initiatives around diversity. And diversity is important, and, you know, we should hire from diverse groups of people and have diversity on our staff, and it's a value we should all have and we should all care about. And they do workshops, and there's this whole thing. Until now, every university in the U.S. will have some policies about diversity and about who they hire and what kind of people they hire. And um, they'll still do regular workshops about diversity. And if you make some rude comment about a person who's another race or something, then you'll be disciplined. And it, it really went from a, a place where we didn't think about diversity at all to where it now really has permeated the whole organization policy-wise culturally, the way people talk and act and think. And I think with openness, it has to be at that level. You know, everybody has to believe, everybody has to buy in. Um, and if they don't, then it's just another two-year project or a three-year project or, oh, Julia's in charge now, so we're going to do openness for five years. But if I wait long enough, he'll leave and then it'll be over. Um, you know, kind of, if that's the way people are thinking about it, then it'll probably just make things worse, actually, instead of better. Because you know, if you're only half committed to it, then you do a poor job, and then stuff just gets worse. Um, the Oh, Fred left already. They've been doing some interesting work at OUNL, um, and we've been doing some similar work at BYU. Um, from a, a business model argument position around OER, so one of the things we found with some, um, well, we just had a dissertation study that was finished a, a, a almost a year ago now on this topic of when people come to look at our open courseware, um, can we use the fact that they came to our open courseware, can we use that as an opportunity to convert them into a regular student um, of our distance learning program? Um, and what we found was that almost 3% of all the students who come visit our open courseware page, at some point we'll click the button that says, this course looks interesting, I want to enroll for credit. They'll click that button and they'll pay tuition and they'll join the normal course. Um, a, and a 3% conversion rate is better than what you get from radio advertising or newspaper advertising or billboard advertising or any other kind of channel. The, the point of the dissertation study was to very carefully track since, we, since our independent study arm already builds online courses, very carefully track how much extra money it costs at the end of that process to then make them open and publish them, and then compare that cost to the extra revenue that we generate from people who come to the open courseware site, click the button, and become a paying customer. And what we found is that it actually makes, our open courseware site makes money. It doesn't cost us money. It's it's the most effective marketing channel in terms of conversion ratio, and it more than pays for itself. So I don't think it will ever go away, right? And um, Fred was saying that at OUNL next month they're starting to uh, they're starting the same kind of study with two of their programs there, uh, and I think they'll find. I know anecdotally that they found. Um, a similar percentage, somewhere between two and four, of the people that come to their open courseware site click a button pay to t and pay money and take a regular course. Um, so I think this is one, one way, I guess I'm kind of talking against myself. Um, even if people don't understand and appreciate openness yet because of openness, I think we can show that openness makes very good sense from a business perspective. So that can get them committed to doing openness and then hopefully over time they can come to appreciate the other value that it has. Does that make sense? I mean, in some ways, it, it's better to do the right thing even if you don't understand why you're doing it. It's still better to do the right thing than to not do it. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Wiley. Thank you.